Hey everyone, welcome in to another episode of The Hours. Uh, we are Savvy Coaching. I am Mark and I am joined by Tyler from a dairy farm. Uh, I mean, Tyler, you know, on? Let me take you through the full process of milk pasteurization. I think that's probably really, really uh, heady stuff here for that's what we're our, here for. Our podcast. Yeah, that, that's what coaches are here for. Um, you just finished up the Idaho uh, camp. How was it? Um, it, it was amazing, actually. So over 130 athletes. So it'll be our, our largest single uh, session, big impact, four programs, Southern Idaho, um, high school, youth. We had about 25 coaches in attendance at different times. Um, and really just I'll share briefly, that is the vision uh, for Savvy Coaching in different pockets and areas across the world, really. Um, we've, we've drastically impacted how basketball is taught and played. Um, and so big shout out to Southern Idaho, the area surrounding Idaho Falls. Um, as we have, we have four programs that have fully embraced the savvy approach, the savvy systems has resulted in um, uh, a state championship last year, um, three state births, uh, four coaches of the year out of this group of programs over the past three years. Um, so it's just really awesome proof of concept. Awesome, man. I know uh, the, the feedback that I've gotten has been really positive. So great job on the road. I've got uh, I got a proposal for you here. Let's um, go. We have a big question that we start with. I, I was thinking about a new segment that we could throw in at the end, like an overtime or before we go, something like 24 yeah. second shot clock. But let's do it early. Sometimes we start with a small question. My small question for you is going to lead into our big question. So okay. small question. J.J. Redick. Hired as the Lakers head coach. Oh, see, I, I've been in camp. I didn't know this. Yeah. So, um, okay. So, perfect. We're going to get your immediate response. That was my small question. What's, uh, what's the response to, to hearing the news? I think J.J. Redick will be a great head coach. I think he's going to struggle mightily in his first year because every first-year head coach struggles mightily. No matter how much you know, no matter how long you've been an assistant, it's just that's what it is. I mean, look at Jason Kidd, for example, struggled mightily in his first year, but now everyone's like, oh, what a great job he's done. Steve Nash, I mean, will you get a smarter, more experienced um, player that thinks the game struggled mightily in his first year? Every head coach, I, I think, struggles mightily in their first year. Yeah, I love the hire. And I don't know, and I agree, he probably won't be successful. I think if the Lakers don't make roster changes, then they probably finish where they're at, no matter who's coaching yeah. them, but just who's LeBron going to get along with. And JJ's <laughs> probably that guy. Um, mm -hmm. Super smart has been, has probably watched more basketball than anybody else. I would say maybe even than some current NBA coaches from a different lens, yeah. right? Um, and I think we'll embrace modern basketball and do things different yeah. instead of just a retread coach. So I love the yeah, news. He I love definitely it. has yeah. courage. He definitely has courage. I mean, even his yeah. with his media stuff, he's had courage. Yeah. So I think you have courage to where a lot of first year head coaches don't. They they tend to defer to you know tradition or even their more experienced assistant on staff. So I, that'd be, that'd be uh, I think I'll say that for the big question. Yeah, and I think for the Lakers standpoint having someone that LeBron wants and is going to get along with. And you, if it's LeBron's guy, he's got to give him at least a year or two pass. So yeah, leads me into the big question. One piece of advice, and you don't have to limit it to one, but maybe the best advice you would give to either a first year head coach, meaning has never been a head coach before, or a sitting head coach taking over a new program. Run the marathon, not the sprint. There's so much pressure to perform and it feels until you have built up that track record of success that when you try something it's going to fail initially and most first year head coaches move off of things that they have felt committed to very quickly and end up doing so many different things that they don't get traction because they're trying to win the sprint to the game on friday or saturday run the marathon uh, zoom out, build a program, establish processes that you believe in and stick to your beliefs. Um, everyone's going to, when you lose your first game, everyone from your players to your assistants to your, your parents are going to have an idea for you. <laughs> um, stick to your guns and give it, give it its due course. Um, that'd be my biggest piece of advice. Yeah. Very similar to me. So you, you said marathon sprint, I would say, Hard part about year one is you're balancing. Am I building a program versus coaching this year's team? Like mm -hmm. where did the where did the the um, where does the energy 
or the focus lie. And you mm -hmm. definitely want to build the program. You talked about establishing processes. I was reading this morning and it said, if you want to know how high the building's going to be, look how deep they build, uh, dig the foundation, right? So mm -hmm. you're really mm -hmm. laying the foundation. And I think if I had to limit it to one piece of advice is don't try to do everything in the first year. Like you mm -hmm. have to be really selective in what's important to you, what's important for the foundation of your program. And if we can mm -hmm. only focus on those things, focus on a few things, right? Simplicity wins. Uh, then you're going to set yourself up for the future and what you do, you will do well. And I think yeah. that would serve a first year head coach more than anything else. You also, I'll touch on one more thing and, and ping pong it back to you. You mentioned like processes and systems. One thing I have uh, found incredibly helpful as a head coach to do very early in your tenure is just establish non-negotiables. Like I, I picture it this way. If I'm a player or a parent and I get a new coach coming in, I want to know what's important to them. So non-negotiables, you're immediately going to tell, I think you're going to, you're going to communicate three things. You're going to tell your players, one, how you can have a healthy player-coach relationship, how they can succeed in the program uh, individually, and then how we can have team success. I think we violate any of those non-negotiables. We probably uh, are going to fall short in one or more of those three categories. So, uh, And then last thing, if I'm a parent or a player, I want to know what you will do for me, right? So what is, what is kind of the purpose? What's the um, the purpose of the program, I think the goal is to win, right? But what's the purpose? Why do you coach? So I would focus on those two things. You should have those answers going into your, your interview, uh, but actually executing those things with systems would be where my focus would lie early. Mm -hmm. Yep. Beautiful. Awesome. Uh, well, JJ Reddick, if you're listening, that's, uh, that's the savvy advice for you, but uh, okay. Sorry. All right. One more quick follow-up question. Jay Jarrett calls you right now. He listened to you on, on a podcast. He's like, I need this dude on my staff. Um, you're offered an assistant coaching job with the Los Angeles Lakers. You need to be there in 24 hours. Um, you're, you're behind the bench, not on the bench, um, consulting um, and providing feedback to him on his practice planning and player development plans. You're offered $250,000 a year for this role. Um, do you get on the plane tomorrow? Gosh, what a question. Um, I'm going to say, oh man, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no. Okay. Well, um, I would, I would love to see your actual answer. If it was an actual one, because I think it would be more compelling if it, if, the, if it was actually there. Cause I feel the same way as you, but I, I, I'm not full hearted. No, I'm definitely right. like, I'd love to test myself out at that level. I would too. I, I just, if, I, if I'm looking at it like that in a vacuum, may, yes, like maybe so. It'd be awesome, right? But then mm -hmm. you look like, man, even if he's somewhat successful, what is that, three years, two years, and, and 250000 living in Los Angeles. Eesh, that's man, true. I don't know. That's, 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 uh, that's, a, that's a lot, that's a lot, uh, a lot less than living in uh, where we live for sure. Yeah, no doubt. Okay. Cool. Or should um, we go uh, mailbag? Let's go mailbag. Okay. Um, I'll bounce this one. I'll put you on the hot seat again. Okay. Um, well, this one's kind of fun. Let's do a fun one first. Uh, Cause okay. this one has been a mailbag question for a couple of weeks. We didn't get to it. Um, most difficult for you complete a pass in the NFL, hit a baseball off a major league pitcher or return a serve in tennis. Most difficult for me would be to hit a baseball from major, major league pitcher. I believe. Um, I believe my pickleball has prepared me to be, be at least okay uh, returning to serve. Um, completing a pass in the NFL, those receivers are so good. Like, I can throw it up, and they have a good chance of making a play on the ball. But it's all on me, um, and I have not hit a baseball. <laughs> I went to the batting cages with my kids. I don't know. And I was like, I used to be a good baseball player. I hit home runs in high school, um, but I was I was brutal. How about you? I Definitely baseball. Um, yeah. Never was a was a great hitter in baseball, and I'm I'm like you, like I, I think I just stick my racket out there and maybe right. get yeah. lucky. I got a better chance at a tennis ball than a baseball. And like, give me give me a running back out of the backfield, and I can just mm. dump it. I, I played a little quarterback in my day. I think okay. I could I could get one. Um, it depend on the offensive line though. Yeah. All right. I remember. Uh, I was, I was, maybe this will be funny for people. Maybe not. 
it, it's traumatic for me, so I'll share my trauma. I tried out for freshman football and I was so skinny in high school. Um, like all of the seniors and upperclassmen during that tryout were saying, were nicknamed me Kentucky Fried. And I didn't get, they said, what's up, Kentucky Fried? What's up, Kentucky Fried? And I just like laughed along with them, but I didn't know. Like, and they were making fun of me because I had chicken legs. Like, I, like they told me that at the end of the tryouts. So I'm like, all right, I'm, tra- I'm traumatized. I'm not playing uh, football. That's how skinny I was. I would have broken my little chicken legs anyway. Anyway, yeah. that uh, yeah, every football reference brings up that trauma for me. So thanks for letting me work through it here with you. Yeah, so I, here's my, uh, my freshman football experience. I was the backup safety and the first string safety was the starting running back. So every time we went like 11 on 11, he played on offense. I got to play with the first team defense. Uh, and mm-hmm. that is like my claim to fame in football. But I would say there's been a lot of football trauma that has made a lot of good basketball players over the years. So Yes, exactly. Exactly. All right. Let's, uh, I'm going to go one more to you here. Um, we had this one come from Coach Sanchez in the uh, our community. Um, coaches on a dribble drive and kick, do you have the passer exit cut strong side or weak side? Yes. I like the answer. Okay. So, so I always default to when we're training first install away from the ball, there's generally more space there. Then level two would be, okay, there's, there's going to be some scenarios that we're going to teach to go to the ball side. Um, based on, you know, if, if you're, if there's a middle drive or whatnot, but I do default to exit opposite initially, but I wouldn't say that as a, an always thing. Yeah. I, I liked your answer of yes, because the answer is always space, right? Mm-hmm. And I get this question a lot of, um, if we drive and we kick here, where do I go? Or if I mm-hmm. kick here, where do I go? The answer is always space. Like where are our home bases? Where are our I always uh, referred to the corners and action spots, like the big magnets on the floor, right? Like where should we get pulled to by default? As long as we're filling those spots, it really doesn't matter. Um, In five out with the alignment, like I know you use the wide spot. I've called it the stretch. Some call it the Houston spot. What I like about that asymmetrical alignment is you can't mess it up. Like your wide spot is just going to change sides of the floor, depending on where you exit cut. Mm -hmm. In four out, it also it matters a little bit more. I'll say that, but sign of a good team is, can we find space? Like, can we maintain space as ball and player move? So I wouldn't get too hung up with that. I think when coaches running a conceptual offense start to think uh, in rules of if you cut, if you pass here, you have to cut there. I think you're doing your, your players a disservice and maybe looking at it through a, uh, maybe the wrong lens or having the wrong approach. So we would do the same and four out. I, I just said, if you find a corner, we're good. Uh, yeah. If we went strong side corner, we usually would have like this escape cut where I kick to you. If you drive at middle, I go baseline. If you drive baseline, I go high where I'm always giving you space. Uh, but even if we, we, you know, kick to the corner, you click it on a two out, uh, we're all going to, we're likely going to be driving it now to the other side of the floor and we all just backfill anyway. So um, yeah, I think our answer is very similar there in nature. Uh, let's go another one here. Let's go. Um, this one's kind of off, off the uh, off topic a little bit, but it'll probably lead into some of our practice better stuff that we'll get to. Yeah. So uh, favorite things for competitive cauldron. I'll go very brief. Cause I do, um, I'll, I will put most of, uh, my specific thoughts into practice better relegation, uh, relegation is a favorite thing for the competitive cauldron. Um, so whether it be as simple as we are doing constrained one-on-one games at four baskets, winners move up and down, and that's where you start at the next time. So it can be simple relegation of that. Um, or if we're doing team stuff, um, like we were doing at our camp this week, um, we had a varsity gym, a JV gym, and a freshman team gym. And um, the, there was relegation every time we did a game. Like a varsity team got relegated to the JV gym and a JV team got to come up. And they had to win the next game to get up and vice and down to the C team. And so the impact that had had on effort, focus, and energy was more so than I could have ever gotten by saying, let's go, bring the energy, <laughs> you know? Um, so any, any anytime there's really painful relegation, I think that helps build your culture. Yeah, really good. I think um, 
the goal of a competitive cauldron is just to increase intensity and engagement level, right? So just by measuring something, having a winner and a loser, you, you, you get away from the let's go, right? From the like pleading them to play hard. You just, you just create the environment that they play hard. Um, All right, let I'm me ask you real. this. Are you for or against relegation in the NBA? Oh, so I'm, like I'm if for it. teams got relegated to the G League. I, I'm for it. I was actually about to say, I know you're not a big college football guy. Mm. You know, you solve all this conference realignment stuff, relegation. Like yeah. there's no reason why Vanderbilt football should be playing in the SEC. Like just relegate them and bump up the next group of five team. But, I, mm. you know, because competition makes us all better. Um, yeah. So I'll say this quick and I'll be quick with the, with the cauldron as well. I think the, we, we just measured wins and I wanted to get win percentage. So I did not get caught up in the, how many assists this player had or turnovers this player had in practice. I, I think that's, to me, that's a whole nother, you know, genre category of, yeah. of what we're going to track. I would put those more as stats. What I want with the cauldron is who impacts winning uh, because the assist and all the stats are going to be wrapped up into that. Um, best thing we did with the cauldron is break it down in the categories because not all games are created equal. So if Tyler and I are playing one-on-one, -on -one, there are very few variables that are going to determine who's the winner and the loser other than just who's better. Right. Uh, so we're going to weight that really, really high. Uh, but if we're playing five on five, uh, I could not touch the ball at all. Or I could be the one that had three defensive errors and my team could still win, right? So mm -hmm. I think you just have to be careful about where you weight your categories. But first, I would establish categories based on how you practice. For us, uh, I think we had five categories. We had one-on-one, -on -one, small sided games, transition, five-on-five, -five, and then we had skill. Uh, and this was fun because it, I think like weight-wise, it was like 5 or 10% of our cauldron. But if we were ever doing a shooting driller game, um, if we were ever doing some ball handling, like we shared rodeo as one of our games of the week where that is a, it's kind of more skill-based, right? Then it gave our skill stuff so much more juice. Uh, we might do a, a shooting drill uh, where the goal was to make X amount of shots in this amount of time. If you did that, I'd give you a win because you beat the drill or if Tyler and I are partners and we have the highest score in the gym, then we get a win. Not going to really impact where you fall in the cauldron that much. But again, the goal is to increase intensity engagement. I think it did that with our skill. Nice. All right. Uh, I got one more for you on the hours and then we'll go to, uh, to the game of the week. Um, burn cuts have been a popular topic of discussion and uh, Kevin asked burn cut rules actually i'll, I'll go first here i'll, I'll share yeah. what i said and uh and then you can you can elaborate on it you even like i mean there, there's probably people that'll listen to this that don't know what we mean when we say burn cut so maybe even like you yeah. know set the table on that I, I i felt it and agreed with it when someone mentioned in our community it seems like there's new language every week um and i was like yeah we need to continue to define it and there's new language every week as we continue to um combine all of the things that Mark and I have taught for years and years and years, but also we continue to learn. Um, like, so, so yes, there's going to continue to be new language um, because there's new concepts. If we stay static, um, Mark and myself, there's less value to you. Um, so we're, we're learning all the time. So that's going to be a savvy thing. We're going to be constantly introducing new concepts because the game is changing. Um, so if you see that as value, you're in the right place. If you're frustrated by that, you're probably in the wrong place. Um, but we will continue to um, attempt to align and simplify our language um, as we continue to evolve it. So I did want to uh, reference that. I know it was, an, was not in the mailbag, but I, was, I thought it was a very good comment that we received. Yeah, yeah, that is good. So I think this is good, too, for us to, to just talk about our language, even if it is similar, right? I think we use burn cut in the same context, but a burn cut to me is like a sneaky cut behind the, the defense, right? Uh, some people call it a ghost cut. Uh, and I like that terminology, uh, but a burn cut is, well, let me, let me, let me, I'll zoom out. Now I'll talk about the principle that I shared and it'll, it'll help uh, tell you what a burn cut is principle is that we want to cut to the rim with advantage. I think more traditional basketball is like pass and cut to the rim to create an advantage. Uh, now we want to keep the basket open as much as possible, right? We're trying to hunt 
uh, the, the world with the dribble. So let's keep as many people away from there as possible. So we don't want to cut in there, but we will cut with advantage because we want to take advantage with advantage. So uh, our sticky language for a burn cut was if they turn, you burn. That was a great way to just signify to an offensive player, you have an advantage if the defense can't see you. So a burn cut is basically a sneaky cut from the weak side or away from the ball uh, to the rim. Um, so principle cut to the rim with advantage. When do you have advantage when your defense, when the defense can't see you? Uh, so that's what I've called a burn cut, but I've also heard people say a burn cut, like in a Euro ball screen, right? Like we're going to get the catch at the top. We're going to burn the wing and it's just like an automatic cut, like a, a spacing cut. Um, that's why I might even be intrigued to use a ghost cut as the, a burn cut that we were, you know, but then you got ghost screen and that's where terminology is yeah. so important. Right. So, so important. very warranted comment in the mailbag, but um, yeah, so that's kind of what a burn cut is and my answer all in one. I'll just add this usually uh, middle drive. We're going to burn from the opposite corner and baseline drive. We burn from either opposite wing 45 high quad action spot, just somewhere above the free throw line extended on the weak side of the floor. Again, I don't want to speak in absolutes. It's not always the case, but I think if you're installing burn cuts for the first time, that's a good rule of thumb to introduce to your players. Yes. I think we're a hundred percent aligned on this. I, I think we are locked in on what we're calling burn cuts and we don't use burn as you referenced the burn, um, sometimes using Euro ball screen stuff. It is behind the defense. We want to burn the back of their head. So it's not a face cut. Um, and when they turn, you burn tells us when burn cuts happen because defense turns on penetration or what we call a hunt. And so we hunt first and burn second as opposed to burn first and hunt second. Um, the additional if then that I teach is you are open or you're burning. So if, uh, if we're in neutral, there's probably not a hunt or there shouldn't be a hunt unless we've triggered by an action. So if we're neutral, then if we're looking to make a pass, make a click, um, and the, the pass is not open, that would be another if then trigger for me on a burn cut, which then creates hopefully a domino catch on the, the blast into space behind. So that would be the additional um, idea that I would offer. Um, and to reiterate to all of our coaches, this is probably one of the biggest difference between um, our conceptual offense here at Savvy and some other iterations of a conceptual offense, primarily read and react, is we don't teach pass and cut. There are cuts that will be made after a pass in, in, in some of our series from neutral, but we don't teach an if then pass and cut, which is probably one of the most frustrating uh, habits that I try to break when I'm installing race and space is players are just passing and cutting every time or passing and chasing with a ball screen every time. It just kills your space um, and actually eliminates your opportunity to get nines at the rim. Um, so the additional um, 45 dive, as I call it, 45 dive, which is a burn cut, um, not just on a baseline drive. Um, I also teach that on a three count unlock on a lane line drive. So if you get a north south drive on one side of the floor, we don't get to the smile. We go into some level of a protection plan, whether it be a stride stop, three count pivot or a Barkley or even a Nash. Um, that would also trigger a 45 dive or a burn cut from the opposite 45 um, as well as a baseline drive. Yeah. Um, I think the old adage of like cutting versus clogging, right? Yep. Cut, the old, traditional offense has been, hey, we got to move, you know, pass and move, pass and move. Now, mm. if we're uh, if we're spacing the floor, we're, we're accomplishing the job. So, yeah, this is probably too much, but I can say it in 15 seconds and it will trigger a lot of questions. Um, I like two burns on across the street drive from the opposite corner. If nothing, then you go into your three count stop on the opposite block area. And then after that first burn from the opposite corner goes, when you turn and unlock the ball with your eyes, the corresponding 45 dive is often open. That requires a lot of patience from your hunter or the pl player with the ball. Um, but patience on offense tends to, um, tends to create an advantage against 
defenses that don't have that same level of discipline and patience. Yeah, I think Benjamin Franklin said there's uh, like three absolutes in life, death, taxes, and defenders turn their head when the ball comes. Yeah. So, <laughs> I, 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 I was like, where is he going? But I liked it. <laughs> All right. Um, do you want to go game of the week or practice? Yeah, I can, let's do game of the week because I can do it in one minute. It's simple and I like it. Okay. Um, it's a shooting game. It's called countdown. Pick your time. I picked 60 seconds. Um, player is shooting. You can go five spots on the perimeter, nine spots, whatever, four spots, designate your spots, whatever. Player shoots from a spot to conquer a spot. They have to make two in a row. They make two in a row. They conquer the spot. They move to the new spot. Every spot conquered is two points. You do it for uh, a minute. I, I'm going to go with a minute here. Um, at the end of the minute, you just say countdown. And then their passer, this is three players, two balls. So you got a, a, a shooter, a rebounder, and a passer. They're getting shots up quick. The passer starts counting down from 10, 10, 9, 8. And whatever spot they're on, they have to make two shots in that countdown. The moment they make two shots from that spot, they also conquer the spot. They get the two points and they reset the 10 countdown. 10, 9, 8. They can shoot forever as long as they can conquer a single spot in less than 10 seconds. Um, added level of pressure, added level of speed, added level of chaos. Um, and they can generate points. So in our one minute countdowns, you know, our better shooters were getting 12 to 16 points. Um, our weaker shooters were getting six to eight points um, in the countdown. So just another game that you can play that um, adds some game like speed and pressure to it um, with the countdown. And I find that that tends to you know, from your your good technique shooters, your accurate shooters, it tends to separate the ones that can actually shoot under pressure, which is what we want to do in games as well. Awesome. All right. So we did a very similar drill, but I love the countdown element. The, the drill, if we're going for one minute, the 10 second t countdowns don't start on the first spot, just when the coach starts to say countdown? The countdowns don't start until a minute has expired. Ah, got it. Okay. So they get to rack up as they get to rack up as many spots as they can for a minute. So that kind of levels the playing field. Um, and then it's bonus time. So, you know, the whole gym might be done except for one hoop who's still on a countdown and everyone's watching it. And that adds to the level of pressure. Um, because we don't start the next minute for the gym until everyone's done shooting. Awesome. Man, I love that one. I love that one. Yeah, it's fun. It's really fun. Players love it as well, which is also a, a big benefit um to any of these games yeah all right let's go practice better um kind of goes in line with the competitive cauldron from the mailbag and we had some questions about this in the community as well if you're not if you haven't joined our new community on school we will send you that link it'll be in the description uh but the engagement and the conversation has been awesome um yeah, and really one, one thing that has come up has been shooting ladder um I'll quickly talk about how we did it one more time. And, uh, and then you can kind of take shooting ladder or however you want to go with that. But, uh, the way we did the shooting ladder, I would spend, uh, first I would select a drill or however many drills you want to measure every day. If you want to just do one drill and measure that one every single day, that's fine. If you want to have a rotation of three, four or five, and you do multiple ones a day, or just pick one, pick whatever works for you. Give it some time, I would say at least a week, depending on how many drills you select, to set the initial ladder. So let's say we just have players one through 10. Uh, and week two, we've got players one through 10 all set. And Monday is going to be an odd day, which means odd spots are up for grabs. So two is trying to replace one, four is trying to replace three, and so on. We do the same drills. If Tyler was player two, and I was one after the first week. And on Monday, he made 47 shots in this drill. Let's call it countdown, right? His score was was higher than mine. Well, on Tuesday, he's going to be one, I'm going to be two. And now even spots are up for grabs. Uh, so three is chasing two, five is chasing four, and so on. Um, that's how we did ours. It served us pretty well. The only other thing that we did, which was fun, is you could have you could challenge one player a day. So at the end of the day, um, if Tyler beat me um, and he has my spot, the next day I could challenge him for his spot. And I think you just have to work through the details of what that looks like. But one detail that I would suggest is that there's only one challenge a day. So if I challenge Tyler and beat him, he can't turn around and, and challenge me back. Nice. 
I really have nothing to add. I love everything you said. So let's leave it at that. I, 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 I'm very conscious of when people say hey, anything to add, and then they say no, and then they add. Um, so Guilty. Uh, yeah, nothing to add. Awesome. Well, um, we appreciate y'all spending this time on the hours with us. Um, keep the community chat going. If you're not in there, join us, and uh, we'll see you next week. Ooh, one announcement. In a few weeks' time, we'll be announcing our new cohort. And next month's cohort is going to be run by my friend Shane Kuiper. Uh, he played at Arizona State and has been working with coaches. He coached professionally in Germany. Uh, has been working with coaches for years uh, with his 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 membership called the Healthy Competitor, um, and it's around how to uh, to really get emotionally and mentally healthy as a coach, so that you don't pour from an empty cup, and to also train our players to be healthy competitors. Um, I think we have all experienced in our players um, a lack of health in their competition, uh, too much association with their identity and value with their performance, which not only can impact them negatively in their lives, but doesn't allow them to perform at their best when you're completely attached to your performance for all of your worth and value. And so from just the, just the mental and emotional health of yourself and your players and as a performance hack, I would really encourage you to check it out. More information coming, and we'll probably have Shane on the hours here in the next couple of weeks uh, to share a little bit more in depth in webinar style uh, what he'll be taking and coaches through in our July cohort. So, um, until next time, stay savvy. Go Lakers.